Jordan McCain. I'm a pastor and elder here at the church. And it's been a wild ride in the church plan. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Susanna's one of the original. She knows. We've been in partying. Um, we are going through, this is the last Sunday of our 40 days of prayer emphasis that we've been doing with the broader Christian and Missionary Alliance. So us and quite a few Alliance churches across the United States, which the Christian Missionary Alliance is the denomination that we're part of, uh, we've been joining in this effort to start the new year on, with an emphasis on prayer. Um, it's not an acknowledgement that like we think everybody's prayer lives are terrible. It's not, Gary, did you do that? Uh, or anything like that. We just know that when a new year comes and the things that we're recovering from in 2020 and 2021, the the solution is God's presence, right? We can do all kinds of different kinds of things, but we know that that's what we need to do is we need to get into the presence of the Lord. We can try to find a bunch of different other answers, but they're not gonna be super satisfactory, at least not in my experience so far. And that's what we do in prayer. This is the last one. After this, we're gonna go back into our John series that we're doing kind of like systematically, passage by passage. And then when we hit like a few weeks before Easter, and when I have to leave, because I'm gonna have a baby, we're going to do the Sermon on the Mount leading up to Easter. So we're going to do like baby. having a baby on March 9th. That's my wife right there. Uh, and my baby next to her. Uh, so we'll do the Sermon on the Mount leading up to Easter where we're going to celebrate and hopefully have an Easter egg hunt and all kinds of things like we did last year. It was a party. And then we're going to uh, get back into John. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, this is version 4.0 of this talk. It's version 4.0 because I restarted four different times. And that's not something I've ever done before. And I was getting really frustrated with it because normally like after the second time, I would have just been like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna blow through this thing. I don't care how I'm feeling. Like I just need to get this done. Which is a really good attitude to have. And um, I just wasn't feeling it. And so I chose to sit with that because I had something weird sitting in my stomach. And I chose to sit with it and I was journaling about it. Here's what I discovered. Um, let's see if you can do some parallel learning because this is how I was processing it. Today we're gonna talk about reawakening to the return of Christ. Uh, you guys know Christ has promised that he's gonna come back at some point. And we know very little about it. Um, so here were the three factors that were intersected for me to have a really hard time talking about this that I realized this week. One, I am very rebellious. And when people tell me to do stuff, I get very frustrated. Uh, if you relate with that, we can form a support group. But for me, I just sincerely, like I just do not like being told what to do. And so when they say, hey, you gotta preach on the reawakening and the return of Christ, and my immediate response is like, I'm not going to do that. Thank you, though. I appreciate that suggestion. That was the first thing. Trust issues. Bleh. Okay. The second thing that's more important than that. I have a genuine, very genuine dislike of the way that eschatology is portrayed in evangelical circles. Eschatology is just the theology surrounding the second coming of Christ. Right? So there are people who make a living creating fear in people's lives by using scripture in such a way that they want them to feel scared about Jesus coming back, right? They'll sit down and they'll sit with you in the book of Revelation and they'll interpret all of these different aspects of the book and they'll say, look how this historical event lines up with this and this does this and you should be like he's going to come back tomorrow and your life's going to be over and all these things and I'm like that does not sound like Jesus it does not sound like the spirit in which Jesus would want us to usher in his return his fear in my opinion of that I, I do not enjoy that um, people who write books about it they sell out conferences about it because people are trying to find an escape from the issues at hand and so we tap into that escapist mentality and we write things like, I'll fly away, oh glory, right? And you're gonna like zoom up into the air and you're not gonna have to worry about creation anymore. 
right? You're not going to have to worry about your problems. But that doesn't work. It just doesn't. I'm not a fan of it. I've been hurt by those ministries, and that's my problem. I have work to do there. I just have a genuine dislike of those things. Here's the third thing. This is all for a reason. This isn't like Jordan's sharing hour, okay? (laughs) You can maybe resonate with me that the Lord's second coming actually scares me a little bit. And to be genuine with you, everything surrounding it is kind of a weird thing. And I was talking to the Lord about this. And I was like, I do want to see you face to face, but not yet, if I'm being honest. Not yet. I like my life. I like what's happening here. I am not ready to give a lot of these things up or live a life where I'm just ready to go at any moment. I'm just not ready for that. Um, I have resistance to that. I'm definitely not going to like, I'm definitely not trying to rush it, right? Uh, and I'm just being transparent. Uh, and so I was. I mean, I have, I have loved ones who do not yet know him, right? Who I want to have the chance to respond positively to his offer of the gospel. And they will not get that second chance after he comes back. That's scary to me, right? I love these people. Um, so I was walking my dog and I was praying and I was like, Lord, what is the spirit of your second coming. Like, what are we supposed to be carrying with us when we anticipate when you're coming back? Because I do not believe it is supposed to be fear. And he showed me Revelation 22. Um, Revelation 22 is the very last chapter of Revelation, right? And at the very, very end, you see verses 20 and 21. So this is wrapping everything up. We're wrapping up some apocalyptic themes. We're wrapping up, here's what it means to be a Christian in the world today. We're wrapping up the new heaven and the new earth. He's like, this is what's going to happen. And this is how he wraps up the whole book. You ready? He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. This is Jesus. He says, I am coming soon. And the author responds in this way. Make sure you can see it. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Right? The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Amen, come Lord Jesus. That was really pivotal for me, to be honest. Because John just saw the craziest things we could ever see. That would just blow our minds, right? Like people spend their whole lives trying to interpret this book. What does this symbol mean? What does this mean? What am I supposed to do with this? Is this thing an Apache helicopter? What am I supposed to do? Uh... And he sees all of this, and when Jesus says to him, yeah, man, like, I am coming soon, John's response is, amen, come Lord Jesus. And so I was asking him, I was just like, what does it mean to posture ourselves in prayer as amen, come Lord Jesus kind of people? Where we're willing to look at the things he's asking us to do, the kind of life he's asking us to live, the kind of things he's asking us to lay down, and genuinely with full heart say, amen, come Lord Jesus. This is good, right? This is the way, right? What does it mean for us to live those kind of lives in prayer? To have an eternal perspective of creation. The things we do today matter, but at some point they're all gonna end, right? How do we hold that tension? So you might not be surprised to hear this, but I do think Jesus is the answer to this question, right? And we're actually going to look at the way that Jesus taught us to pray and look at the things he taught us about what prayer is supposed to be and ask the question, how does this help us become the kind of people who say to the hard things of life, amen, come Lord Jesus. So we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer, right? This is Matthew 6, 9 through 15. So if you have your Bibles or devices, I would invite you to turn there. And before we get started, I'm going to pray for us. Will you join me? Jesus, we want a relationship with you that is not only feels genuine, but truly is genuine. Not one that looks good, but truly is bathed in your goodness. We want to be the type of people who are willing to say yes to the things that you ask us to do, even the very difficult things. 
We want to be people who seek after your face in prayer and know you for who you have created us to be, and we are grateful for it. Holy Spirit, be at work today. We're going to do some work, and we trust you to identify some things in our hearts that we know you've been at work in for a long time. I pray for freedom today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, ready? We got three parts. If you're keeping track of notes, we're going to talk about what this passage has to say about the significance that we want. We're going to talk about the outcomes that we expect from life. And we're going to talk about the justice that we desire in life, right? We're going to talk about all these things through the Lord's Prayer. But first, let's read it. If you have it, I have it up here. It's probably pretty small for most of us. I'm going to read it from Matthew. This is the NIV. So uh, the disciples asked Jesus, to, how do we pray? And Jesus says this, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Four. If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I just want to acknowledge right off the get-go, it's a good philosophy of life and ministry that the disciples asked Jesus, hey, how do we pray? Which assumes the fact that they probably thought Jesus knew how to pray which is just a good way to live your life. It's like, what do I do in this relationship? Maybe Jesus actually knows. I don't know. It's a pretty good philosophy of life. Let's talk about the significance that we desire in life. God is not at odds with you about your significance. He's not. Whatever you've been taught, he is not against you in the things that you desire or want. Uh, I believe that wholeheartedly. Um... He almost certainly thinks better things about you than you think about yourself, would be my guess. It's been my experience so far. Our original intention, if you read the book of Genesis, was we were created sinless to be co-creators and co-rulers with him, right? He wanted us to dream and desire. He wanted us to love our work. He wanted us to live life well. That is his heart for us, and it remains his heart for us. Here's the rub, though. We have this propensity to choose to define good and evil on our own terms, right? That's what happened in the garden. And so when we take the gifts that he's given us and we worship those gifts instead of worshiping the one who gave them to us, we begin to get a wonky idea of what life is supposed to be like. We begin to get a wonky idea about who we're supposed to be, right? When we begin to say, when we get to move from, I'm pretty good at teaching, to I'm a teacher, to if I'm not a teacher, I don't know what I am. That's a very subtle transition. And it becomes strange. And it's going to mess with you a little bit. And it's a manipulation and a perversion of one of the best things about us. That's the hard part. Is that work is part of our identity. And that things that we do and we love are part of our identity, but we go too far with them, right? We get too into them. So we move from being a co-ruler with God in the world to a solo ruler with our own little empire and our own little thing that we're trying to build and our own little kind of life that's supposed to be perfect around the American dream. And you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, it's just not going to work. It will not. You will have to be blind to the things around you to think that you can actually make that happen. And when weird things happen to you or hard things happen to you, it's going to ruin your sense of how this life is supposed to be lived, right? It's going to challenge the things you've based your significance on. So when you're at work and you say, this new promotion will finally help me be fulfilled, right? Or I gain pleasure in being a boss and telling people what to do and practicing power, right? That is not a good place to put your identity. Or if you're like, I am a wife, I'm a spouse, I'm a son, I'm a whatever. Those are part of who you are, but they are not your whole identity. I'm kind of a music buff. 
everybody's kind of a buff on something these days that it makes me laugh every time I hear it. And it's like, I'm kind of a whatever. Uh, I'm part of this ideological political party because their values are God's values. No, they're not. They just aren't. Uh, we, when we say things and we declare, I will only be happy if X happens. We don't say that out loud, but that's how we feel. You're on shaky ground every time. It's going to be very difficult to recover, and you're going to be disappointed every time. Here's the thing. You need significance. You have to have it. It's a human need. God put it in us, right? It is good. It, is, it has a purpose. You do have value. All those things are true. No one deserves to feel insignificant, in the world, and God did not create the world to be that way. But all of those above things, work, identity, role, those can be taken from you in a moment. Right? Those are all things that you cannot build on because they will not last forever. And we do mourn and we grieve when parts of those things leave, but we have the capacity to build our identity on something so much deeper that cannot be taken from us. Right? Look at the first five lines of this prayer. I have them up here. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Very quickly, in five lines, Jesus is asking us to submit to four things. And I'm going to run through them. Don't stress about it. But one, that our, our identity is primarily that we are God's children. That is the number one thing. That's it. That's where we build everything off of. Number two, that God alone is holy and worthy of worship. There's nothing else worth it. There's nothing else to worship. Number three, that his kingdom is our first priority, not our kingdom. Every, everything revolves around how do we bring the kingdom here to earth. And number four, that his will on earth is our primary concern. It's the first thing that we move towards. In five lines, he's asking us to lay down so many things, right? That I want to define myself the way I want to define myself. Not as a son, I'd rather be X, right? Hallowed be your name. I would rather worship this TV show or worship my job or whatever, right? I would. Those things bring me more life right now. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Laying down your expectations and rights in the midst of all that. Five lines. We pray this thing every week, and I was just blown away by, like, you can just say those things over and over again. And then when you start looking at what it's asking of you, Jesus is trying to totally flip our strategies for how we build our identity upside down and how we build our significance. We're, mi we're missing the point, is what he's trying to say. He is saying, if you want eternal significance, this is the kind of life we're being asked to live. This will go with you because this life will someday end. But your sonship, right? God's holiness cannot be affected. He will not become more or less holy. If you have submitted to Jesus as Lord, you will never become more or less his son or daughter, which is pretty hard to believe. I work with people all the time whose view of God is that when I mess up, that means that he does not love me anymore, or he loves me less, and he moves away from me. Can anybody relate? That is not the gospel, and it's not true. That nothing can stop his kingdom from coming. The only thing you can stop is your participation in it when we choose to step away from it. And nothing is going to change his will and creation. He has created this world that when you live a certain way, it works really well. And so when we see the life of Jesus, Jesus lived as a human being the best way humanly possible. Right? He is the best human. If you want to know what it means to be a good human, we just look at Jesus, right? Nothing will change his will in creation. And so we have, to under, we have to look at our lives and wonder and be curious about the things that we've built our significance on, the things that we think give us value, and ask, are they eternal? Are they just good things, like the things we, like our hobbies or our jobs, things we like to do, things that are very fun? Or have I gone too deep with this? And I won't know who I'll be anymore if this is taken away from me. Right? Those are kind of those are questions that Jesus is asking us.
These are the questions we ask in prayer. Number two, we have to ask ourselves about the outcomes we expect from life. Expectations are tricky things. They're very scary if you don't pay attention to them because we expect a lot of things that we don't realize we expect. Some of you guys in this room have been very disappointed in life. I know that for a fact because I know some of your stories, but I also feel it at times in the room. There's a lot of disappointment in our lives. Some of us carry more of it than others. Some of us have been hurt a lot more than others, right? So there's two options when you get into the midst of that. You can become powerless or you can power up. I love watching people who power up. It's one of my favorite things. People who have decided to become powerless is that, well, because of the unmet expectations and disappointments of my life, I'm going to choose to not feel anything at all, right? Which is not a good track to go. Because even if you think about it neurologically, when you shut down one emotion, you slowly begin to shut down every emotion. That's how it works in our brains. They're all connected. So we see people who kind of become these emotionless, unfeeling folks. And it's kind of scary. They feel like life has become kind of futile, right? That they can't actually change anything in their life or their situation. It's too difficult. Then the flip side is, and it's the same coin, by the way. The flip side is, is that you're going to power through unmet expectations by more strongly declaring what your expectations are and forcing the world and the people around you to meet them and being really upset when they don't, right? And if they don't meet it, then you just try harder to make that happen, right? In your midst of your anxiety. So you refuse to submit to any expectation but your own and you expect the whole world to follow suit along with you. And it just goes really well. Like I've never seen that backfire. Um, don't talk about who you're thinking about in your head right now. It's not good. Um, oops, I flipped the wrong page, I'm sorry. So what happens when we have an unprocessed disappointment is that we either lean into powerlessness or powering up and we're gonna roll with an iron fist. And so then we use these lenses that we've formed and then we begin to make predictions of our life accordingly, right? So you're gonna get ready to go have coffee with your friends and you already make the meeting ahead of time. Well, I'm gonna have to go have coffee with them but it's probably not gonna go well and they probably think I'm a terrible person and I don't know, like I'm just not gonna expect any joy out of this because it's gonna to be too hard and I don't wanna be disappointed, right? I've seen it, it happens. Uh, they've given up hope. And then a powered up person usually just has no effect of their sense on the world. They've totally shut down their empathy. Right, and so they're gonna dominate the conversation. They're gonna make people feel the same shame that they feel and project it onto them. They're gonna shame people. And um, people are gonna be afraid to get to know them. So it doesn't require any kind of intimacy from you or any kind of vulnerability. So they kind of create a culture of fear around where they live. Here's what God might say to those two kinds of people. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts. How do these two things connect? I think he's communicating two things in this moment. Again, what does it mean to submit our lives to the Lord's Prayer? The first thing is this. We are totally dependent on the Lord for every good thing, right? That's been the position of theology, theologians for centuries. There's nothing we receive that's good that does not originally come from him, from the source of all good things. Daily bread here is a picture of the manna in the wilderness, right? Who knows where we get the manna from? What's, what story is that from? Jim, we got manna from, heaven. manna from heaven. And who received it? The Israelites. The Israelites in the book of Exodus, right? So Moses, he murders a guy, and then he goes out into the wilderness, and then God calls him to go free people, and he goes back, and he frees them, which is awesome. And then he crosses the sea, and now he's got this whole group of people. They're on the other side of the sea, so they cannot go back, right? And they're walking through, and it turns out in the desert there's not any food or water, so they kind of are upset about that. And so God says, I have an idea. I will send manna from heaven every day, right? And manna are these little wafers that taste like honey. And it says in the Bible that you could eat like two of them and you'd be full, right? Which is pretty legit. It's a good weight loss program. 
And so you would just like gather them and they would be covering the ground and they look like uh, dew, like dew on the grass. And they were everywhere, which is super sweet. Uh, thank you, Lord. Um, manna then becomes, that doesn't last forever. It's just while they're out in the wilderness. But manna becomes a picture then in the rest of the Bible for God's provision. So well, God, look what God has done. He like literally made food materialize from the sky so he could probably take care of me would be my guess um but here's the rub that always comes with that the people the israelites that are out in the wilderness they time and time again became super ungrateful like every time they had to take a turn they would be like well it'd be really nice if we had some variety in our food and it's like this is coming from the sky you know, like we just be like, what? I mean, it's from nowhere. We have food and you don't even have to eat any of it. And they're like, yeah, but I mean, it'd just be nice if it tasted a little better. And we're like, all right, man. And then it's like, I brought, God gave us water. I hit a rock and water came out of it. Isn't that sweet? And they're like, yeah, but I mean, it'd be nice if we were back in Egypt. And you're like, what is happening to you people? Like they're insane. And Moses gets really upset. And then he like put snakes on them or something. I can't remember how it all goes. But they're like, yeah, we want better leaders. We want better stuff and everything else. And we're upset about it. And that's kind of how it goes. They became ungrateful. And if you read the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews 4, it says it's because of their ungratefulness that they actually were unable to enter into the promised land. A whole generation of people. Which is up, it's kind of sad. That was the whole reason they left, was to enter the land of milk and honey. And because they complained so much, and they were disappointed so often... They did not get to go, and only their children's children got to go, right? That might feel harsh, but listen to this, guys. Every day, every single day, a disciple of Jesus has a promised land in front of them, regardless of your situation. I'm, not, I'm really not trying to make a leap here, but I'm not. The Lord has given us a, the access to abundant life regardless of your situation. And you have this beauty in front of you of a life that's probably, even if you're not happy with it, pretty good, right? And we choose to be ungrateful for it. And yeah, if that is your choice, and that's where you're gonna keep going, you will continue to be disappointed. And you will be in a vicious cycle of like, yeah, my expectations are too high, so no wonder nobody can beat them. Or my expectations are so low that everything's the worst. It's not gonna be a good time. You're not gonna have fun. If we're willing to be grateful, and here's the big thing, and here's where we're talking about a prayer posture of surrender. If we are willing to release our expectations of what we think life is supposed to be, if we're willing to let go of the outcomes of our days, right? we will begin to notice the things that are good instead of saying things should be this way, right? We have to let go of our expectations of the outcomes. I wish my spouse was whatever. I wish my kids looked like this. I wish they acted like this. I wish my parents would treat me like this. I wish blah, blah, blah. Those are good things to hope for. But chances are it's it's going to be okay and it actually might not ever happen so would you prefer to continue to sit in disappointment in the midst of that or would you prefer to go well my kids aren't who i want them to be but i love my kids like why would i not be grateful for them like my spouse does not always do the things i want them to do and i'll continue to communicate and love about the things i prefer to change but i have a spouse and it's pretty good right it's so difficult. This was life changing for me. Any expectation you have about another person will almost always leave you feeling disappointed and them feeling manipulated every time. You can only have expectations for and responsibility for yourself. Otherwise, yeah, you're going to be disappointed a lot, pretty much all the time. And we're going to talk more about this. But what does it look like then for us to have a daily surrender of what we believe our lives are supposed to or should look like and just accept them for what they are? 
and hope for the best. The second thing about this that he communicates to us relating to this, we are totally dependent on him here for daily provision, here for a good life, but here for sanctification and righteousness. We do not have any choice but to be dependent on him for those two things. You do not have a plan B for that. That's it, right? Part of being either powered up or powerless due to your repeated disappointment and hurt is you are choosing a life of self-righteousness. And that feels harsh. But you are choosing to define what it means to be righteous or good or live a good life for yourself. And that is outside the bounds, almost certainly, of what God defined as a good life. Okay? That doesn't work. You have made a meaning of your life that God did not give you, and it is not serving you. It is making you miserable, right? God did not tell you that you were powerless and you have no control. God also did not tell you you were the boss of everything and you get to control everything in your life. Neither of those things are true. We are totally dependent on the Lord. Here's what God has done. He has given you an identity as a son or daughter, as a steward, as a co-ruler. That is found in intimacy with him as you build a life together with him. And he will teach you to dream. He'll teach you how to dream again. He will teach you how to be a good boss with good character. He will teach you humility and how to use power well. And he will teach you to have hope for joy in the midst of community. But you have to rely on him for those things. They are not just things that you can muster up from your expectations. Say, well, if I go to a new church that's better and has better community, then they'll fix it, right? That's what should happen. Well, actually, the common denominator of all your relationships is you. If your relationships aren't good, that is probably your problem, right? Which is hard, but it's true. And it's okay, because it can get better. But our, our idea of preference and jumping around and hopping it's not going to serve us. We are trying to medicate something that's ill inside of us that only Jesus can fix. Only he can forgive us. Only he is the source of those good things. It does not matter. God saved you and he saves you daily with a daily outpouring of grace when we seek after him. And it is a beautiful thing. And he will restore us. And when he says he will forgive us our debts and he is faithful and just to do so every time. He has promised that. We have to surrender the outcomes that we expect from life. Here's the last thing. We're going to land here and then we'll close up. We have to surrender the justice that we seek. All right. Here's the last part of this. As, I know I finished in the middle of a sentence, so it's not ideal. But as we have also forgiven our debtors, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then he follows it up with this teaching at the end because people would get frustrated. And so he wanted to make them more frustrated by saying this. If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. That's a sucky. That's hard. I'm not supposed to say sucky. That's rough. Uh, Jesus here points out very clearly that we live in an imperfect world. There's two people who are going to hurt us. There's going to be the people around us who are going to hurt us all the time, like maybe constantly. And there's going to be an evil one, spooky devil, who's going to literally be coming against us on a regular basis, right? And trying to tempt us into sin. These are two areas of extreme frustration, right? But he gives us the resources to persevere. What are they? One, to lean on him so that he can deliver us from temptation, and two, to forgive everything, which is just the worst, right? I made this observation with Sarah yesterday, and I, I work with a lot of young people. Young people have maybe, I think millennials and younger have one of the best sense for injustice, and the best nose for injustice in really any group of people I've hung out with, right? If something is not fair, or if it's wrong, They'll immediately just be like, that's not fair. And they'll just be like, yeah, fix it. Am I right? They'll just like call it out every time. Sometimes it's a little too much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're ready. They are skeptical. 
They are cynical, they are critical, and if you do anything wrong, they're like, no, I don't like it. Get out of here. And then they yell at you. Uh, here's the thing. I think you're right. I think it, I don't, I, this is literally very, in the most literal sense, this is not fair. Right? I'm just going to acknowledge that. It's not fair because it's not the form of justice that we would create for ourselves. We have created a punitive system where an eye equals an eye, right? And a foot is a foot and a hand is a hand. And when you injure someone's eye, then your eye is going to be injured. It's actually very similar. I think Jesus talked about that somewhere. Um, but we've designed a system of justice. And when we did, it does not actually look anything like this. And we just acknowledge the reality of that. But here's the thing. Surrender in this moment of justice means trusting the Lord, which is very difficult in this moment because he made creation. And so he gets to define what justice looks like. Right. And we have to submit to that and we have to get angry about it and we have to get sad about it. And then we have to submit to it. And it is very, very, very hard. It goes against every part of our human nature to not hold grudges, to not get bitter, to not say, well, why would I forgive them? They've never even asked for an apology. Those are all the worst things I can think of, right? I am with you in that. People are going to yell at you. People take advantage of us. But here's the thing. Here's the most ugly part is we are disciples and apprentices of our master. And our master lived the perfect human life. How did his perfect human life end? I know we're all afraid to say it, but you guys know what it is. What happened to him? He didn't just die, but he was, he was murdered by a group of people for a crime that he did not commit in any way. He did not do one thing wrong and he died right? He is our vision of what justice is. Because as he was dying and asphyxiating on the cross, slowly suffocating and losing the ability to move his body, one of his final seven words was, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that is awful. That is so hard. <laughs> We, I keep grudges from people for so much more tiny, petty, smaller things that are so frustrating to me. And I will hold on to that and I'll form narratives around it and I'll like treat people. I'll even like go into a situation and be like, I'm going to treat them so normal, but inside I just dislike them so much. Right? And we do that. And yet my savior who lived the best life possible forgave me on the cross for the sin of the world. That is not fair, but it is justice. That is justice as God defined it. And it's hard. I carry so much unforgiveness in my heart. Every day I have to walk through and check with my heart and see if I have picked up any bitterness in people. One, I'm a sensitive person, but two, we just do it naturally. I have to do that every day. Because I want to be like my Messiah. I want to be like the one I've submitted my whole life to. I want to forgive regularly. Because otherwise my heart will begin to turn stagnant and cold and hard. I do not want my heart to be that way. How are we supposed to carry this around? This bitterness and this frustration. When justice is the Lord's. That's the question we have to ask ourselves. How, and how do we surrender it? Here's what I'm learning. Here's where we're ending. And then we'll move into our response time. Here's what I'm learning on a daily basis. Whenever we choose to surrender any of these things to Christ, when we hand them to him, he hands it back to us better. I've just seen it time and time again. When I hand him a piece of my identity, I said, I'm a pastor, and I don't know who I would be if I was not a pastor. But what I want to be is your son. So I'm going to hand you this, and I'm going to be okay if this doesn't happen. He hands me back a better identity, and I feel amazing. He does it time and time again. When I go into a meeting, and I have a very clear expectation, and I want to dominate the room, I say, actually, I'm going to hand the outcome to you, and I'm just going to be present. 
I'm going to listen. I'm going to see what happens. It is better every single time. And I've watched people's lives get transformed by God's presence instead of me trying to make things happen the way that I think they should happen. It happens every single time when I surrender these things. And I've said to the Lord, take my life, and he's given me a better life. I've said, take my expectations, and he's given me a better life. I've said, take my unforgiveness, and he's given me abundant freedom, right? I don't want to hold these things against people anymore, and all I have is freedom. And I have never once been disappointed for giving Jesus something in prayer and releasing it to him and saying, I'm just not going to hold on to this anymore. I've never been disappointed by that. I've been frustrated. I've been super uh, resistant to it and kind of mad about it when he's asked me to, but I've never in the end been disappointed by that. Not once. And I think that, bring it full circle to eschatology. Ready? Here it comes. You're supposed to do this the whole time. This was better. When we do this daily, we become come Lord Jesus kind of people. Because the Lord himself gets to decide how this world is going to be run. He's chosen to do that in unison with us as his creation. He loves human beings and he made us for it. But in the end, he will come back when he wants to come back. And he, all he asks of us is to hold everything open-handedly so we can be ready and rejoice when he does. That's all he's asked. I do not think there is much that you can say about his second coming with much accuracy or like predictability. I've spent a lot of time on it. I, I just don't think that there is. Um, I think it's a good hobby and that's all it should probably be, to be honest with you. Um, I think you would be much better spent spending your time studying the life of Jesus and how he lived and trying to figure out how he's going to come back. But he is going to come back. And we are called to be expectant and surrendered to that. And it does mean to accept that God has a better plan for you, for your life, than you do for yourself. And he loves you more than you love yourself. And he has better expectations for you than you have for yourself. And he is not afraid of anything going on in your life. In fact, he's excited about it. And he's going to enter into it with you. That's what I, that's my, that's my thought. Every week, we end our teaching time with the expectation that the Lord is going to meet us there. Uh, that we know that he is at work in our hearts. And I would find it really hard to believe, I could be wrong, I'd find it really hard to believe if he has not identified for some of us a very clear one or two things that he might be asking us to surrender to him today. What we do in our response time is we try to live the life that Jesus has asked us to live and give it a shot and try some practice. Um, for some of us, this is easier than others. It usually, usually involves some silence, usually involves some meditation, usually involves some sitting with the Lord and maybe praying to him for the first time in a long time. We really value that. Um, we value that coaching aspect of that. That's why we sit around tables, help people process. You'll find in the middle of your table, there's probably a bunch of index cards. You might journal with a journal. See, Gary's got a journal, this is good. Uh, you might write in your Bible. Uh, you might write in your phone, whatever it means. Uh, we're gonna spend the next like 10 minutes just very genuinely asking the Lord, what am I holding on to in my hands that you would much rather I let go today, right? His hope for you is freedom for abundant life. And so anything that he would ask you to let go of, right? A piece of how I view myself that I consider absolutely essential, but has nothing to do with how God views me, right? He might be asking you to let go of an expectation or an outcome for something that's gonna happen uh, in the future, right? A job or something like that. He might be asking you to get rid of a part of your false self that you wanna project to others, a way you want to look to others, right? Sometimes we're really good at figuring out what those things are, the way we want others to see us. He might be asking you to get rid of a grudge that you're holding on to or a really strong sense of bitterness, right? Any of those things. I think the Lord is always at work. He's always ready to receive any of those things from us. 
And so we're going to spend the next 10 minutes, I think Mallory's going to play some music in the background, and we're just going to sit in the middle of the, what the Holy Spirit has to say, and we're going to write down some things in our phones, in our journals, on a note card. We're going to take that with us today. Let me tell you this. If you discover something really intense, right, um, something that's very emotionally is hard to handle, is, is heavy, you can reach out. Please come and talk to me. You can talk to some people at your table. Uh, there are leaders around the room who would be happy to help you process, but we would love to help you walk through what it looks like to be a disciple in that area, and that would be really meaningful to us. So do not be afraid to go deep into some of those things, because we would really like to help with that. It's something we have a lot of experience with. Um, I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to start our 10 minutes, and then we'll call the kids back in, and we'll do announcements, and we'll be on our way. Does that sound good? Hey, listen to me. Do not be afraid of what you might find in your heart. It's going to be okay. All right. Jesus, we are very thankful for you. We are grateful for the life that you have given us. We know that your intentions for us are good, and we know you have given us all the tools to live an abundant life. We believe that. We believe we know what it means to live a healthy and good life. Lord, we want to be like you, and in this moment, we want to choose to surrender some things to you, to give you parts of our life that maybe we've held on to for a little bit too long, some things that we've failed to grieve, some expectations that are really hard to let go of. Lord, we just want to be with you in this moment. I'm just going to pray. Come, Holy Spirit, meet us here today, and just help us to process some things that might be really important to you and might change the trajectory of our futures. In your mighty and holy name we pray. Amen. I'll be back up in a couple minutes.